In this video, I'll be reacting to Patient's life-changing hair transplant after her transition on the TLC channel. So in the age of COVID, I like to meet my patients outside so I can see them before we mask up. Hmm. That's interesting. I like that. That's a nice approach. It'll be harder for me in Manhattan to do that. So I like to do virtual consultations first. And then when patients show up, you know, usually I'll have my mask up, but they still have seen me, especially because of all our videos. When women lose their hair, it's something that people question and it can be a much more of a psychological issue for women than it is for men sometimes. So when men go from male to female, it becomes super important for them to be able to establish that hair as their identity as a female. I agree. I, I get many patients who are transitioning wanting just that, you know, they want to look the way they feel and uh, hair is a big part of that. And not everyone wants to just wear wigs all the time. A hair restoration procedure is essentially taking hair from the back of the head, which is the donor hair, and replacing it into the balding area. Yeah, most of the time the donor area is the back of the head, though sometimes it's other areas. Usually the first line is going to be to go to the back of the head, but as we run out of donor supply, which happens with some people who get multiple procedures, then we start to think about the neck, if there's hair there, and occasionally chest and back. Transplant, I will surgically remove a specimen. Basically, what she's doing here is an FUT procedure. So she's harvesting from the back of the scalp by removing an entire section and then suturing that up and that's gonna leave a linear scar. Now, a lot of people out there will poo-poo this technique. I think that it still has its place in the arm and tear for hair transplant and it's a procedure that definitely works very well. One of the reasons they probably chose to go FUT over FUE is because they were looking for plenty of graft yield. So like, if you're trying to maximize your numbers for how many grafts you're going to transplant, oftentimes FUT will yield a higher number of grafts compared to FUE. And out of the back of the head, that tissue will then be passed off to my technicians who will dissect each hair follicle individually out of that specimen. Then I will make into Yeah, the process of actually like transplanting the hairs at the recipient area is going to be the same between the FUE and the FUT procedures. But the way that you extract the grafts and how you process them before they go back into the scalp is gonna be different. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna look at your donor area. I really want to do this procedure for Jamie, but until I evaluate her donor hair area, I just don't know whether we're gonna be able to do it. Suspenseful. Best case scenario for Jamie is I would like to be able to harvest 3,000 grafts. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, actually. Yeah, 3,000 sounds about right. You can get to the 3,000 with FUE technique as well, but it will limit you to a degree with how many additional procedures you can do down the road. So that may be why she went the FUT uh, route, which I think is quite reasonable. My own family members have suffered from, from hair loss and have underwent the procedure. So my litmus test with patients is, is, if you're my sister or you're my cousin or you're my best friend, would I recommend a hair transplant to you? And if the answer is yes, we're gonna move forward with you. And if the answer to my family member would be no, then we're not gonna move forward with you either. Yeah, I think that's a nice way of saying it. I mean, I think we all as doctors ought to take that approach and that mentality. I think it's good that she uh, basically elaborated on that and, and made it very uh, obvious that that's the approach she takes, that's nice. This is my one and only chance. Otherwise it's wigs for the rest of my life. And if it's just wigs for the rest of my life, I will feel like I will never be whole. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's her one and only chance. Like, let's say she did this FUT procedure and it didn't work out. There would still be grafts back there to still do, I think, a nice procedure. But it is true that the more procedures that we do, the odds of getting a really nice uh, outcome at the recipient area starts to go down. So getting it done well from, from the get-go and then refining it over time if needed, I think is very important. I do consider you a very good candidate for surgery. I am super excited. Yay! Coming into all of this, my biggest fear was just straight up. I do like to have the conversation of FUT versus FUE with, with patients because some patients are very afraid or um, just not open to one or the other. So I think it's it's good to present it as, as options. And if I really don't feel like one of the options is in the best interest of my patient, I'll make that very clear to them. But I think it's good to display all the options to patients. I'm a bit anxious. I mean, just the idea of having my back of my head torn open and things shoved in the front is a little disconcerting. Yeah. But I'm 
absolutely trust in her. She's created a more feminine hairline that's closing down the corners and bringing the hairline forward by uh, at least uh, about an inch there. So that's a fairly aggressive design. I mean, there's a lot of loss here. I may have designed it in a more conservative way, keeping that hairline a little bit higher, but still following that rounded curve towards the temple area into the sideburns. So it's a superficial, what we call skin surgery. Patients will sometimes say, do you get to see my skull? And I'm like, if we see your skull, I'm calling 911. <laughs> I'm going a little deep there. <laughs> yeah, so the scalp is made up of different layers. And with the hair transplant, when you're doing the FUT, uh, you're basically just going to the depth of where the bulb of the hair follicle is. So into the subcutaneous tissue where the fat layer is. So you're not quite reaching uh, the, the galea layer, which is deep to that. We've started Jamie's surgery and I'm about to remove a piece of specimen out of the back of the head. And that's where all the hair follicles are located. I'm gonna start making the little incisions. I'm now going to make the individual incisions where the follicles are going to be placed. So this is the... T yeah, these are called the recipient sites. And the way that this doctor is doing it is actually a very similar fashion to how I do it as far as the equipment used. So she's using a blade holder and these little tiny blades that you can use different sizes on. So typically when I'm doing hairline work, it's usually going to be a 0.6 millimeter recipient site blade. And as we move further back, we have to increase the size of the blade to accommodate uh, heavier grafts, right? Because the hairline is going to take the single hair grafts, the little fine hair grafts to create a natural appearance. And then as you move further back, now you're introducing two hair grafts, three hair grafts, sometimes four hair grafts, and that's going to require a bigger recipient site. It's about paying attention to the right angle and direction and orientation that the hairs would have been in in their native state. Yeah, that's very well said. It's, it's exactly what it is. And, and every surgeon is going to design that hairline in a slightly different way to create the irregularity that you need for naturalness and just that overall design and pattern. Sounds like a pencil and paper. <laughs> And then, of course, the area is numbed up first with local anesthesia so that patients can tolerate this and also to reduce bleeding. The number that we harvested was 2,860. Yeah, that's pretty now good. We, that's really yeah, that's pretty good. So just shy of her 3,000 graft goal. But that's the thing with um, with FUE, you know, you can pretty much know exactly how many grafts you've taken out. When you do a strip harvest, it's sort of guessing. You know, you, you roughly estimate how much you'll need, but you don't really know what you're getting. So now at this point, if she wanted to get more grafts, she can actually go back there and do some FUE in addition to meet that 3,000 graft goal if needed. I didn't get the 3,000 grafts that I was hoping for, so there might be some concessions that we have to make along the way. But it's still a very good solid number of grafts. However, there is one potential issue that I need to make Jamie aware of. I'm finding that her procedure is not going to be necessarily surgically challenging, but it's going to be aesthetically challenging because her hairs are very, very fine. So when you separate very fine hairs, it limits the density. And so you need to get those hair follicles as close together as possible to be able to create that. It's very common if you're going into an area that's completely bald with a hair transplant, it's very common to have density that will not match the original density. That's normal. It would be very odd for that density to match original density. The best thing to do, I think, is to prepare patients in the right way to say, look, we're going to do a hair transplant and things are going to be much better, but they may not completely meet your aesthetic goals when it comes to density. So you might need an additional surgery to then double down on density. And most patients will accept that and understand that. And that's one of the reasons why people get additional hair transplants over time to build up that density, especially into completely bare areas. A very successful surgery in being able to completely address the area that had no existing hair, which is the area of most concern. Right. But the top and back that we didn't get to has existing hair in it that we're just going to um, maintain with medical therapy and try to stimulate with other. Yeah, so basically some of the sites I'm sure that she's created further back, they were not filled because she didn't get all the grafts that she was hoping for. But she's saying that will probably be okay because, hey, it's further back and you're going to be able to use some of your other hairs and use medical therapy to try to cover up over some areas that are thinner and then maybe come back in the future for an additional procedure. I think that's an important component of this as well. But it seems like overall it's it's going to, it should be a nice result. All right, is this post-op? Let's see, how many So months? I'm going to be seeing Jamie again today. 
It's been eight months since her eight surgery. Months, okay. Yeah, eight months you start to see some changes for sure. Usually it takes about 10 to 12 months for more or less the final result, but eight months, you know, things should be coming in. Wow. All right. This thing worked. When I was at my most bald, I had lost. Surely it's reshaped her face and it looks like the hairs are starting to come in and we basically need to wait for at least another four months before saying, okay, this is the density that we have and potentially Jamie would be a candidate for maybe an additional touch-up procedure. We'll see. So we're gonna plan for letting this continue to thicken up, grow more, we'll reevaluate at the 14 month mark, and then we'll maybe plan for doing another procedure to go in and thicken up the hairline zone and give you more density in the areas where it was the. I mean, well said, yeah. I mean, I think her plan makes a lot of sense for Jamie. Question will be, is she going to reopen that FUT scar, do an additional FUT procedure, or might it be best to then come in with FUE to get however many more grafts um, they'll need? I've evaluated, you know, her donor area again. There's good scalp elasticity, which gives me the ability to go back and do a second procedure to get her even closer to that full head of hair. So when she's talking about scalp elasticity, that suggests that she's probably going to go back in and do another FUT procedure because it's that elasticity that allows you to essentially do like a scalp reduction on the back of the head, which is really what an FUT procedure is. Since I've had this hair transplant, I've been able to see who I would be with hair. And that's been something that I never thought that I'd have. You know, I think uh, overall, you know, I love seeing these types of results that are obviously nice, successful results from hair transplant surgery. And I like seeing when things are being done properly with good technique. And that has been demonstrated here. So thanks very much to, to this doctor, Dr. Phipps, to Jamie for sharing her story and to TLC for broadcasting this. Since you like this video, make sure to check out our reaction to Sandy's six month hair transplant journey. Click the card. We'll see you there.